Hello, welcome to the University of Lincoln's Christmas Lecture Series from the College of Science. This is our final lecture of the week. However, if you want to catch up with our previous lectures from this week, please visit our YouTube playlist. There is a link in the chat to our website where you can find details of the talks along with joining links and instructions. Now it is my pleasure in introducing Dr. Ian Heslop, who will be talking about Santa, the high-risk traveller. Merry Christmas. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Ian Heslop. I'm currently the acting head at the School of Pharmacy here at the University of Lincoln. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Santa, the ultimate high-risk traveller, um, and we're going to really talk about travel health because travel health is a, a research interest of mine and uh, it's a really, well, I think it's a really interesting topic. So what we're going to talk about today is, first of all, I'll just introduce what travel health is and, and why it's important to, why I think it's important, but also why society thinks it's important. We'll talk about some of the risks of travel. And then I'm going to talk about how we assess a traveller and advise a traveller on their journey. And we're going to use Santa Claus as our uh, traveller uh, because of the destinations he will have to go to. Uh, shortly, we'll talk about uh, his risks and uh, how we can uh, reduce some of those risks. In the process, we'll also talk about a few uh, diseases, that are interesting diseases and, and a few travel-related health issues. Unfortunately, because of the time we've got today, we won't have time to talk about all of the diseases and uh, travel health issues that, that Santa could face, but we'll talk about a few interesting ones. So first of all, I'll just talk about what travel health is, because some people might not know what travel health is. It's a relatively new uh, health specialty or, or medical specialty. And for a long time, we've known that there's been an association between people traveling and the spread of certain diseases. So some of the earliest reports of this were the Athenian plague in, in 400 uh, BC, the medieval uh, Black Death, the plague, and, and so on. These were examples of how we associated how people move and travel, how that can spread disease. The specialty of travel health, though, really only became a true specialty in about the last 50 years. And it was mainly because of things like factors like large, uh, large scale, affordable air transport, mass tourism since the Second World War. People started getting more interested in travel and how uh, travelers are affected by disease. So it's become a specialty in its own right now. If we look at what a definition of travel health is, all the textbooks will have a definition like this in them. Uh, but basically what travel medicine or travel health looks at is we're trying to prevent illnesses and injuries occurring to travelers who may be going abroad and overseas from the UK. And if they come back from overseas and they have health problems, we're managing those health problems. The specialty of travel medicine and travel health, though, also looks at the impact of tourism on health systems. So if you've got a lot of travellers going to a particular country, how, how will that country be able to cope with all of those travellers if they have health issues and, and those types of things? And recently, increasingly, migrant health has also been included under the travel health umbrella. So there's some of the areas that travel health looks at. But the main areas of involvement of travel health are helping travellers who are going overseas and trying to prevent them having uh, health issues when they're overseas or when they come back. So really the travel health specialists, the doctors, the pharmacists, the nurses who are involved in travel health do pre-travel health assessments and give advice to travellers. We're involved in the supply of medicines and various medical related goods to try and prevent people getting health issues when they're overseas, things like vaccinations. And also we're involved in the management of health problems when travellers return back to the UK and they've maybe caught some sort of health problem when they're overseas. So they're the main areas that travel health focuses on. I guess the, the question is, why is this important? Well, travel health, we now recognise that travel health is a really important part of medicine and part of healthcare, and that's because travellers are a really important group. Like the name suggests, travellers travel, they're very mobile, and when they go overseas, 
they can be exposed to various diseases and they can then import those diseases back into their own country. But likewise, travellers can take diseases from the UK and take those diseases to the country that they're visiting. Now, one of the things we know about travellers is, if you look at all of the studies, often we notice that travellers are actually at greater risk of disease or death uh, when they're overseas than they are at home, especially if they go to developing countries or low income countries. And the reason for this is that often travellers take risks when they're overseas that they wouldn't normally do at home. They may be travelling different uh, forms of transport, they maybe eat unusual foods, they maybe they meet different people, and so they're at a greater risk of catching diseases when they're overseas than at home. And if you look at some of the studies, it's estimated that about three quarters of visitors to developing countries develop some sort of health problem when they're overseas or when they come back from that country. But the important thing is that most of the cases they do develop uh, a, a relatively mild. They're not not all of the cases are serious, but it's estimated that three quarters of them will get some sort of health problem when they're overseas or when they come back from being overseas. So I guess what are the risks of travel? And there was an interesting study done by uh, Robert Stephan, who is a, a Swiss professor, and he looked at uh, what are the chances or what are the risks of travellers getting disease when they're overseas. And he did this study and he estimated that if you've got 100,000 travellers going to a developing country for a month, he estimated that about half of those travellers, 50,000 50, of those travellers, will develop some sort of health problem during their journey. About 8,000 of them will have to go and see a doctor. 5,000 of them will have to go to bed because they're so unwell about 300 of them will have to go into hospital and about 50 will have to be flown home because they're so unwell and unfortunately out of those 100,000 travellers unfortunately one of them will die when they're overseas so that gives you some ideas of uh, the chances of having health problems when you're overseas but what we've got to remember is that a lot of these illnesses are relatively mild and um, so there is it's still a good thing to do travel so I guess, what are some of the health risks of travel? Now, in travel medicine, we tend to focus on either the prevention or treatment of infectious diseases, but only about 1% to 4% of deaths in travellers when they're overseas are caused by the infectious diseases. Most, more often than not, the illness or the problems that they have are caused by other things. And what we see that the, on this slide, I've got on the... Um, left hand side we've got some of the common illnesses that travellers get and by far the most common illness that most travellers get when they're overseas is what we call traveller's diarrhoea it's uh, where, where the person gets diarrhoea and this can occur in up to 90 percent of travellers but in most travellers it's relatively mild and self-limiting that means that it will cure itself over after a few days other common things that travellers get are things like respiratory infections, so things like colds, flu, and now COVID, I guess, are the common respiratory infections. And then some travellers do get um, things like malaria and other tropical diseases, but these are diseases where the chances of you getting those diseases are relatively low, but if you did catch the disease, then the, the implications of that disease could be quite high. Now, we know that the most common uh, vaccine preventable conditions that travellers get are the flu and COVID and hepatitis A. Now, if you look at it, unfortunately, like I said, a, a very small number of travellers may die when they're on holiday or um, <coughs> overseas. And if we look at the reasons for uh, people dying when they're on holiday, Malaria is a common infectious cause of death, but by far the most common cause of death in, in travellers from the UK when they go overseas are things like heart attacks and accidents. And the accidents are usually motor vehicle accidents. So um, again, like I said, travellers take risks uh, overseas that they may not take at home. So 
if they're used to driving on the left hand side of the road and they go to a country where they're driving on the right hand side of the road that increases the chances of them having an accident and unfortunately some drivers like i say take risks that we wouldn't take at home and they may be driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs another common cause of accidents of travelers is drowning as well so people doing activities that they're not used to doing or maybe getting out of their depth if they're swimming and that causes drowning so there's some of the sort of health problems that uh, travelers can get when they're overseas now <clears throat> when we're looking at travelers there's some very important trends which um, we need to know about because they affect the chances of you getting various health conditions and so on. The first trend that we've seen certainly in the last um, you know, 30 or 40 years is that the number of travellers is increasing. So if we look at the figures until 2020, um, every year we saw more and more people travelling internationally. So the, the United Nations World Tourism Organization estimated that by 2020, we would have 1.6 billion people traveling from their country of origin to another country every year. And that's an incredible amount of people. And these are the figures that uh, the World, uh, World Tourism Organization provided. And as you can see from 2012 to 2020, there's been a steady increase in the number of travelers. Now, of course, in 2020, we then had COVID the COVID pandemic and all the borders shut. So there was less people traveling. So the, the number of travelers dropped. But what we're seeing now since uh, you know 2020 onwards is that the number of travelers is slowly increasing again. Now the pink line in the middle, this is the European travelers. And again, we're seeing a similar thing that European people now travel, are starting to travel again. The brown line, and uh, this line here, is people traveling in Asia Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region. And as you can see, the number of travelers there is still low and is still dropping. And the main reasons for that is uh, because a lot of the travelers in the Asia Pacific region are uh, from countries like China, India, and so on, and uh, they're still having some border control. So uh, their numbers continue to drop for a period of time. But generally what we'll see, I mean, hopefully what we'll see is once the pandemic, you know, in, in a year or two's time, we'll start seeing levels of travel that we saw before the pandemic. Now with travelers, there's also some interesting trends. And from a travel health perspective, what we're finding is that people who are traveling tend to be going to much more different destinations than they were 10 years or 20 years ago. People are often going to high risk destinations now, destinations in developing countries. They're often traveling at very short notice. They're making the decisions very quickly to decide to go uh, to different countries. And they're often doing less planning before they go because they may be taking the advantage of cheap airfares or cheap holidays and making a last minute decision to go on their holiday. The other thing that we're noticing is that people's idea of risk is decreasing. Um, 10 or 20 years ago, to do things like whitewater rafting, bungee jumping, all of these sort of activities were often seen as high risk activities. But now, especially in younger people, they're seen more as you know, everyday activities. People are taking much more risk than they used to. And unfortunately, a lot of travelers, particularly UK travelers, are also traveling without travel insurance. And in, in the UK, we're lucky we've got the NHS. And if you get into health issues, you can go to the NHS and uh, they'll be able to help you. Unfortunately, in other countries, if you have health issues and you go to a hospital or a doctor, you'll have to pay for that. So um, having travel insurance is, is a very important thing to have if you go overseas. Other things that we're seeing in trends of people traveling is a lot more business travelers are traveling than we used to see before. Um, and we're also starting to see more travelers you know, before COVID and then hopefully after COVID. We start to see more travelers coming from countries like China and India than we used to. 
And another interesting tra uh, travel trend that we start to see is that it's not just young, healthy, adventure type travelers who are going to exotic destinations. Increasingly older people are traveling to these destinations too. And again, they're doing risks that um, before, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, only young people did. So you do see uh, older people doing things like bungee jumping, motorbike riding, etc., etc., in some of these destinations, which you never used to see. So there's quite a lot of interesting trends going on. Okay, so what I've tried to show you there very quickly is that although there's a lot of benefits to travel, there is some risks associated with traveling. And from a travel health perspective, as a travel health health professional, what we do is we try to reduce these risks for each traveler. So for each traveler, how we try and reduce these risks is the traveler comes to see someone like myself or a, a doctor or a nurse in a travel clinic or in your GP surgery. And we do a pre-travel health risk assessment on the traveler to try and identify some of the risks associated with the journey. We then make up a plan or devise a plan, an individual risk management plan to try and reduce the risk. So we look at do they need vaccinations, do they need advice, do they need any medicines to go with them to reduce the risk of them getting uh, travel related uh, issues. Okay? And we also do this for travellers who come back and uh, maybe they've been overseas, they come back and they're not very well, we assess those travellers. And then we document the care that we give. Now, to do this takes about four to eight weeks to do it properly, because some, with some vaccines, you can't just take the whole course of the vaccination straight away. You might have to take you know, a month or two to get the full course of the vaccination. So this is one of the problems that we're now seeing. If people are making decisions to go on holiday very quickly, we don't have time to put a lot of these um, risk management uh, techniques in place and it means that the person can't get diseases or illnesses when they go overseas. So like I said with our traveller it's important the first stage if a traveller comes to see myself or another health professional to get travel health advice the first thing we have to do is we have to do a risk assessment on the traveller to devise an appropriate um, you know, uh, plan for that traveller so that they don't get any health problems when they're overseas. So the first thing we have to do is we have to look at the traveller's health. Um, do they have any diseases that either will increase the risk of them getting problems when they're overseas or may cause problems? We also have to look at the destination that the traveller is going to. Then we decide what vaccines or medicines we need to give the traveller and then we educate the traveller about the disease risks in that destination. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this with our traveller. And like I said, because it's Christmas, Santa is going to be our traveller. And we're going to do a risk assessment on Santa. And we're going to look at his um, journey and decide how we can help him so that he, he remains healthy on his journey. So Santa's our traveller. He's going to be travelling with some companions, so he'll travel with his reindeer, of course, Rudolph and uh, Prancer and Dancer and all the other reindeers. And he'll also have some help, elf, elves. He'll have some elves with him as well to help him on his journey. Okay. His journey, his mode of transport, sorry, he's going to go by sleigh, which is a very unusual mode of transport. Um, so there'll be some risks associated with his transport because it's open to the elements and he's going to be flying around the world and um, so we'll have to take that into consideration too. And his journey is quite unusual, he's effectively going on a day trip but on this day trip he's going to be going all over the world and visiting most of the countries in the world in a very short period of time. So that's an unusual journey and we'll look at some of the risks associated with that journey. So like I said, the first thing we have to do with our traveller, if we're going to advise him, is we have to look at the traveller themselves and work out, is there any particular risks with this traveller? So like I said, Santa's our traveller. and We need to look at his age and his gender. So he's male. 
and he's over 1600 years old so he's quite an old traveler and um, he's originally from turkey and um, but he now lives in uh, the north pole so he's a laplander and apparently the canadian government also gave him a passport in 2013 so he can also claim canadian citizenship as well so that's his background i guess what type of traveler is he i suppose he's a business traveler because he's he's on his his journey is his work and um, in some ways though he's very similar to an air crew traveler like a pilot or a air stewardess because he's flying around the world he will come into close contact with people that he meets but hopefully he won't have a very long contact time because um, he's going to be visiting so many places in such a short period of time that any contact he has will be minimal and of course because he's traveling on Christmas Eve most of the people he comes into contact with should be asleep anyway so um, you know children should be asleep and that sort of thing so he's a very unusual type of traveler his vaccination history I guess he's 1600 years old so we're not really sure what vaccinations he would have had and certainly 1600 years ago there wasn't many vaccinations but we'll assume that he's had some of his vaccinations we'd have to do a full medical assessment on him and look at his medications and, and any allergies he's a very overweight elderly person but we'll assume that his, his health is generally good for his age you know it, it, he's, uh, he's doing well for a 1600 year old man what's his attitude like because if we're going to give him advice it's important to know is he going to be able to accept the advice we give him or is he going to ignore the advice well like i said he's 1600 years old so we'll assume he's a bit cantankerous but he's maybe in a hurry he's in a hurry he wants to get his information quick get out budget wise though and um, i don't think santa has any worries about uh, his budget so if we recommend vaccinations and that sort of thing he's happy to pay for them so that's our traveler we've also got to assess the risks associated with his journey okay and if we look at his journey and we look at the countries he's going to be a normal traveler maybe only go to one or two countries on their journey and um, Santa's going to go to just about every country in the world and he's only going to do that in between 24 and 31 hours okay so he's going to be traveling to various time zones so and he's traveling very quickly so he's actually got about 31 hours to uh, drop off all his presents but that means he's going to be traveling at between 1200 and 1800 miles per second so he's a very quick traveler and um, what regions is he going to be traveling to so is he going to be traveling to capital cities major major towns rural areas well he's going to be doing all of that he's going to be visiting all areas and it's estimated that he'll visit about 366 million homes in that 31 hour period okay does he visit every country well no because some countries have slightly different traditions so he doesn't actually visit every country but he visits the majority of countries and um, how long is he going to be in those countries well again it's going to be very short he's going to visit about between three to five thousand homes a second so it's a very short visit like I said, he's a business traveler and um, he's traveling by sleigh um, but he's going to be in quite close proximity to reindeer and as we'll see, being close proximity to some animals increases the risk of you catching certain diseases. Um, what's he going to do? Well, he is quite a high risk because he's going to be doing a lot of climbing up and down chimneys and things like that. So these are sort of high risk activities. But like I said, he's effectively going on a very, very quick extended day trip, which is an unusual journey. The big concern we have about Santa, though, on this journey is his diet on the journey. OK, so it's estimated that if he eats, say, two chocolate chip cookies or a mince pie at each home and drinks a glass of milk in this journey, he's going to have to drink about 50 Olympic swimming pools volume of milk and about 40,000 tons of mince pies or cookies and that works out to be about 150 to 3 374 billion calories which is 60,000 times the recommended daily calorie intake and that's a very high calorie intake in his journey so that increases the risk of him getting lots of diseases and um, but maybe diarrhea and things like that 
It's also estimated that if he runs eight minute miles, he's gonna he's gonna have to run for about one uh, one hundred and nine thousand years to burn off the calories that he eats in that journey. So he's taking in a lot of calories. So maybe we also need to look at Santa's diet during the journey. So this slide, the writing on this slide is very small, but it just summarizes if Santa was an average traveler, what types of risks he would face on some of these on, on a journey like this. So he, like I said, he's gonna come in close contact with animals. He's gonna be jumping into people's houses. Uh, people have dogs and cats and various other animals. So he's at risk of an animal bite, but I guess he's gonna be visiting the house so quickly. Uh, the dog would have to react quickly. Like I said, he's in close contact with reindeer. Um, because of his diet, I'm concerned that he may get traveler's diarrhea on his journey. And then there's a the risk of various other issues like what we call economy class syndrome, where, which is where he gets clots in his legs, jet lag because he's flying around, etc., etc. So there's lots of different risks that he will face. Because he's gone through so many countries, uh, is at high risk of catching a lot of diseases. So he's at high risk of catching a lot of tropical diseases like malaria, yellow fever, and some unusual diseases like leishmaniasis, um, which we haven't really got time to talk about today, unfortunately, because they're quite interesting diseases. He's at risk of catching some um, insect borne diseases. So a lot of diseases are carried by things like mosquitoes and flies. Uh, but I guess what will help him is he's not going to be in those countries very long. But there's lots of different infectious risks. So what I'm going to try and do is talk about some of the risks that he'll face. We haven't got time to talk about all of them because, because of his journey, he's basically exposed to a wide range of diseases. So we'll talk about some of them and some of the vaccinations that we'd recommend for him. And um, the rest, you know, we'll, maybe have an opportunity to talk about it at another opportunity. And so like with any traveler, we need to develop a risk management plan. So Santa's facing all of these risks on his journey. We need to look at how we're going to try and reduce those risks. So this is what we would do. We would look at what general health measures we need to check with our traveler, so Santa. We would look at, do we need to give him vaccinations and medicines? to reduce the risk of him getting any diseases when he's overseas. And we'll also look at some of the risks associated with some of the destinations. And then we've got to, as a health professional, we've got to try and educate Santa um, so that he uh, has a lower risk of disease when he, when he uh, goes uh, on his journey. So <clears throat> let's look at his general health measures first. And I guess the first question is, is Santa fit to fly? Okay, so we need to find out, does Santa have any chronic medical conditions? Are they well controlled? Now, in uh, countries like the UK, pilots have to have an annual fitness to fly assessment. And so Santa would have to have uh, one of these assessments too. And we would check in for any medical conditions and make sure that they're well controlled. So someone like Santa is relatively old, he's very big, He's you know, quite obese, and um, so he's at high risk of things like high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, and these types of conditions. So if he has any of these conditions, we would have to make sure that they're well controlled and that he's healthy to fly. Okay. The next question we would ask, and this leads on to the next point, is we need to know, has he had all his routine vaccinations? And if he's not had his routine vaccinations, we need to look at the reasons for that give him those vaccinations. And certainly, like I said before, uh, one of the commonest um, conditions that you can get when you're traveling is influenza and COVID. So nowadays it's important that if you do go overseas, it's important that you get your seasonal annual influenza jab and nowadays also a COVID jab as well, just to make sure that you're immune against uh, these diseases or, or your, your immunity is at its highest level, I should say. Okay, now we need to decide what vaccinations Santa should get. And when we're talking about travel health, we divide the vaccines up into three types of vaccines. We talk about routine vaccines, 
we talk about the required vaccines and the recommended vaccines. Now, the routine vaccines, these are the vaccines that you're normally given as a child. And um, so we'd have to check whether Sanders had these vaccinations. And if he's not had his childhood vaccinations, we need to give him boosters. Okay, now, um, important vaccinations when you're traveling overseas are uh, vaccinations against measles and mumps and German measles, which is called rubella. And we give, we give that protection as an MMR vaccine. We also need to check that it's got um, vaccination coverage for diphtheria, tetanus, uh, whooping cough, which is pertussis, uh, varicella, which is chickenpox. And again, he needs to have his annual influenza jab. So there's certainly some vaccines we need to check that Santa's had in the past. The required vaccines, these are the vaccines that legally you have to have if you're entering certain countries. So the, the most common one of that is yellow fever, and we'll talk about yellow fever soon in the next few slides, because uh, it's quite an unusual vaccination. And uh, you need that if you're visiting areas of the world that where yellow fever is very, very common. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, for some countries like Saudi Arabia, if say you're going to and Mecca in Saudi Arabia, you have to have had um, meningococcal vaccinations and you have to have an influenza vaccination. Then the recommended vaccines, these are the ones that we sometimes recommend for travelers who are going to certain destinations. So for Santa, certainly ones that we need to consider for Santa are meningococcal again, because meningitis can be is common in some countries. Uh, a disease called Japanese encephalitis, or JE, which is, it's not just common in Japan, it's common in Asia and uh, into the Pacific countries. Yellow fever, hepatitis A and B, and typhoid. Um, now, you wouldn't have to get all of these vaccinations every year. Some of these vaccinations, once he's given them, that will give him lifetime cover. Some of them he might need boosters if he's not had them for a while, and we'd have to uh, talk to Santa, work out which vaccinations he's had in the past and work out which boosters he needs. We'd also have to consider him giving him a vaccination for cholera, which is a type of severe diarrhea if uh, there's an outbreak in one of the countries he's visiting. And we'd also have to discuss with him whether he needs rabies shots as well, uh, if he's going to come into close contact with animals. So let's look at, we don't have time to talk about all of those vaccinations. Let's look at one of them and talk a little bit about uh, the vaccination and why, why it's interesting. So yellow fever is a, it's a very, it's a viral condition and it causes, um, you catch it by being bitten by certain mosquitoes and it uh, causes you to get fever, chills, loss of appetite. And in a lot of patients, it's a viral condition, similar to getting that cold or flu, and it disappears after about five years. But in a small number of people, about 15% of people, after the five days, the fever then comes back, and the patient develops a really severe disease, and they get stomach pains, they get liver damage, which makes them go all jaundiced, so they, what is, which is why we call it yellow fever, because their skin goes yellowish, the whites of their eyes go yellowish and um, it can lead to bleeding risks and kidney damage. And it's a very, very severe disease. But like I said, it's only about 15% of people who catch this disease, but it can cause up to about 50,000 deaths a year in Africa. So it's, it's, a, it's a very serious disease. Like I said, it's not common, but if you caught it, it could be very severe. So because of that, um, we, we use vaccinations to stop it. Now, it's carried by this um, mosquito. This mosquito is called Aedes aegypti, and it's a very easy mosquito to spot because it's got white knees. If you look at its legs, its legs have got little white spots on them, which are the joints. So it's a very easy mosquito to spot. And um, this mosquito lives in countries like Africa, South America countries, but also in Asia and into the Pacific in countries like Australia as well. And it carries lots of uh, viral diseases like dengue, uh, yellow fever, Brahma forest fever, Ross River fever, and lots of other tropical diseases. Um, this is just uh, two maps which show where yellow fever is prevalent or, or common. 
So it's really common in uh, these African countries in the central part of Africa and in Brazil and some of the other South American countries, okay? Now, if you visit these countries and then come back to the UK, it's a legal requirement that you should have been vaccinated before you go. And if you visit these countries and you come back to the UK and you weren't vaccinated, you'd have to go into quarantine. Okay? Now, the vaccination is quite interesting. It's what we call a live vaccine. So we take the virus and the scientists in a way damage the virus so that it can't cause the infection. And then we inject that into the person as a vaccine and that then the, the body builds immunity up to the vaccine. So we used to give this vaccination, it's called Stamaril. And we used to recommend that I used to give a, about 10 years covering, you used to have to get a booster every 10 years. But nowadays we recognize that uh, after one jab, you get lifelong cover. Now, the interesting thing about uh, yellow fever vaccine is its side effects. So um, in most people, um, you don't get a lot of side effects, but there's a couple of really unusual reactions. One of them is called Yelland, which is yellow fever vaccine associated neurological disease. And this means that it damages the nerves in the person but it only occurs in about um, 0.8 uh, people per 100,000 doses given. So it's very rare, but it's more common in elderly people. And then there's a really severe reaction, which again is very, very rare, called yellow fever associated viscerotropic disease, or yellabd. And this is very similar to getting wild yellow fever. So again, it's a very rare condition However, the, 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 the side effect is more common in older people. So with Santa, we would have to decide, should Santa be given a yellow fever vaccine uh, before he goes to those countries? Now with a normal traveler, we would probably say, well, if the risk of the reaction is really high, maybe it's best that you don't go to that country. But because Santa's got to go to that country, you would have to make a decision whether it's appropriate for him to get the vaccine. I guess the advantage would be that because he, once he's given the vaccine, he would only have to have been given the vaccine once. Okay, so but these are some of the things we have to talk talk to travellers about. So we would decide what vaccinations we need to give Santa, and then we would look at what risks each of the destinations that uh, Santa is visiting has, and advise him on how to reduce the risks. Uh, at those destinations. Now, like I've got in this slide, Santa isn't staying very long at these destinations. So we would take that into consideration and make a plan for each of the countries that he's going to. We would look at where he's going, what's he going to be doing there, dropping off presents, of course. Is there any disease outbreaks um, and so on? Okay, so we take that into consideration. And then we would have to advise uh, Santa or the traveller about what we're going to, um, what we were recommending him to do to reduce some of the risks associated with his journey. So we would look at things like, is there any disease outbreaks in the countries he's visiting? Should he be careful about what he eats and drinks? If he gets diarrhea, what he should do with the diarrhea? How to stop getting insect bites and so on? Um, you know, how to deal with things like jet lag, motion sickness, DV, uh, DVT, um, trauma, medications, what, what things does he need for those, okay? Now, one of the conditions that uh, he will come across in his journey is a condition called malaria, which is a really common, um, a relatively common tropical disease. And it's common in these areas that are co colored brown. So again, Africa, through into Asia and South America and Central America and into the Pacific, uh, but not Australia or New Zealand. And it's caught, again, it's carried by a mosquito, but in this, this time, it's not the same mosquito that carries yellow fever. It's a one called the Anopheles mosquito. And there's various different types of malaria, but the one we are more concerned about is one that we call falsipara malaria which is caused by a parasite. This is the parasite in the person's bloodstream, and it's caused by Plasmodium falciparum. And it's a very aggressive and um, sometimes fatal form of 
and malaria. So we have to uh, look out for this one. I'm just looking at the time, so we'll, we'll go through this quite quickly. But malaria, like I say, causes like a flu-like uh, symptoms. The person goes through attacks or phases of this. And like I said, uh, falsic pain and malaria is uh, you know, the one that we worry about because it can cause fatalities. <clears throat> now, to prevent, so someone like Santa going to a malaria area, to prevent him catching malaria, we, we follow what we call the ABCD rule. So we make Santa aware that he's going into a malarial area. We make sure he's using precautions to stop him getting insect bites or mosquito bites. We consider giving him an anti-malarial drug to, to help reduce the risk of him catching the malaria. And then we'd warn him about the signs and symptoms of malaria so that if he does catch malaria, he can um, do something about it. And you know, get it checked, go to the hospital, get it checked, get an appropriate treatment. <clears throat> So I guess the question is, should Santa take anti-malarial tablets on his journey? Well, he's certainly, he's certainly going to be spending a lot of his time, if you remember on that map, the brown area, if he's visiting every country, he's going to be visiting all of the countries where malaria is present. And in particular, he's going to West Africa, which is, is where a lot of people do catch malaria. I guess the advantage is he's going there, and he's going to be traveling through these countries very quickly, but at this time of year in the tropics, we often have the wet season. So there's lots of mosquitoes around. So we do need to decide whether Santa should take an anti-malarial tablet on his journey. And if we do decide, we need to decide which is the best tablet for him to take. And uh, health professionals like myself would help uh, advise him which is the best one to take. And he would need to take it a couple of days before his journey and then for about two weeks after his journey. Now, whether we can convince him to take that tablet or not will depend on uh, Santa, uh, but certainly if he doesn't use the tablets, he needs to um, look at ways of stopping him getting bitten by mosquitoes. And he can do this by, um, you can do this by following some of these simple rules like uh, using insect repellents, um, keeping his arms and legs covered so that it doesn't uh, increase his chance of getting uh, uh, insect bites. <clears throat> like I said, I'm concerned about Santa's diet and I'm concerned that he may get diarrhea because of his diet on his journey because he's, he's eaten a lot of food and he's probably not eating the best food on his journey. So we need to warn him about traveler's diarrhea and we need to give him uh, advice on uh, what's safe to drink, what's safe to eat, and maybe try to stop convince him not to eat as many of the mince pies and uh, milk while he's on his journey. Um, this is some of the things we would advise a normal traveller. So we would advise them on what foods are good to eat, what foods are, um, he needs to be more careful with so that he doesn't get diarrhoea on his journey. And if he does get diarrhoea, because he's quite old, He's at risk of some of the complications of diarrhea. So we need to make sure that if he gets diarrhea, he drinks lots of water. We can maybe use a drug like aperamide to help control his symptoms. And then if the symptoms don't resolve very quickly, we can give him antibiotics to treat his diarrhea when he gets back from his journey. Like I said, there is, uh, Santa is gonna come into close contact with animals. Um, so when he's visiting people's houses, there's a risk of him being bitten by animals, but he's moving very fast, so that risk will be very, very low. When we live in close contact with animals, though, we sometimes get a group of diseases called the zoonoses. These are diseases that are common in animals, not as common in humans, but that humans can catch from animals. And he's going to be in very close contact with his reindeer, like Rudolph, etc., etc. And there is a disease called leptospirosis, which is a bacterial disease that you can get, catch if you come into close contact with uh, the urine of infected animals. So again, it's one of these diseases that it's not a common disease. Um, and in a lot of people, it doesn't really affect them. But in a small number of people, about 5 to 10% of people who catch this disease, uh, it can be potentially fatal. So it's important that Santa... Um, 
you know, washes his hands after he stroked Rudolph, tries not to come into contact with Rudolph's urine, um, and if he does get the infection, he needs to get appropriate treatment for it. Okay, so we also need to add, educate Traveller on a few different things. So we need to uh, reduce his risk of economy class syndrome, but he's going to be moving around a lot. Uh, we could maybe get him to wear compression stockings. Um, and he, he, he is potentially at risk of jet lag, but again, he's, he's going very quickly, so he might not get jet lag, he may just get tired. All travellers need to be aware of their personal safety, but uh, Santa's lucky because the elves are with him and they can do security detail to make sure he doesn't get mugged on his journey. But I mean, no one's going to hurt Santa, I don't think. So in summary, uh, in some ways, Santa is a high risk traveller. Uh, if Santa was a, tra a traveller, we would be concerned about some of his risks. Um, however, for Santa, because he, he's moving so quickly around the world, that's going to reduce the risk of him catching infections because he has a low contact time. I think his main risk would be things like traveller's diarrhoea. The risks of the other conditions would be relatively low. Um, and if you were, if he was a normal person moving at normal speeds, the person would be uh, face a lot of risks, but Santa uh, wouldn't face as many. Um, certainly though, I think he need, we need to make sure his vaccinations are up to date. Um, we need to uh, make sure he's, you know, he just get bitten by any insects and uh, he needs to be a little bit, bit more careful about what he eats and drinks on his journey. But he should be okay uh, so long as after his journey has a long rest. Okay. So that's um, looking at some of the travel health risks associated with Santa. Okay, I don't know if anyone's put any comments in, in the box or questions. Yeah, some more questions there. So I just want to um, wish everyone a really pleasant Christmas and festive season, and I uh, hope you all have a, a, a lovely time. Thanks a lot now, bye.